So I'm uh, very happy that you came here to Gothenburg. Uh, we're at Skogen. Uh, and uh, you are a dancer and a choreographer. You have, as a dancer, you worked since the early 2000s for Göteborg Sopran, uh, Foresight Company, Kullberg Balletten, and probably some more companies that I haven't included. And since uh, 2010-ish, you've worked as a choreographer, mm -hmm. making your own productions. Yeah. Yeah. And you also work as a teacher. Yeah. Yeah, and pedagogue. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the first thing I actually wanted to talk about is something we have in common, I think, which is um, the relationship between dance and philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my work, I've uh, noticed that if you go to the philosophical tradition, at least the Western philosophical tradition that I'm uh, working in, uh, either dance is like not mentioned at all. Mm -hmm. If you go to like the big aesthetic theories uh, of uh, Hegel, Kant, like they, they're not interested in dance at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, or my favorite philosopher, Theodore Adorno, also no dance at all. Mm. Uh, and then you, and then in one part of that philosophy, if you go to someone like Nietzsche or uh, Alain Badiou, who we're going to speak about in a, in a little bit, uh, there is, like, some philosophers mention dance. Nietzsche is one of them. Uh, but then dance is this, like, it's not like, it's not dance as art, mm. da dance as, uh, but it's like this um, almost like transcendental yeah. metaphor. Um, for, for freedom or for some other non-linguistic expression. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so I'm always stuck in this, uh, and, and, and more people with me, uh, Bojana Sveic, uh, performance dance theorist, mm. uh, has written a great article about this as well. Um, so there's that line, and then in the, I think, mid-2000s, there were a couple of choreographers... Uh, from let's say Xavier Leroy to I'm not sure about Jérôme Bell, but there were a couple of maybe Xavier Leroy, the French choreographer, comes to my mind first, mm -hmm. uh, who turned to philosophy, uh, Gilles Deleuze, but also to others, um, and sort of used philosophy as um, almost like tools in mm -hmm. their processes, as kind of like productive concepts. Mm -hmm. Um, but I find that in your work, because you have worked uh, uh, with f philosophy very explicitly mm -hmm. in at least two of your works, in some sense, yeah. from 2016, and also Whatever Singularity mm -hmm. from 2000 and... Uh, oh, that one start, 13, 14, yeah, kind of yeah. a series, yeah. yeah. Um, and in your work, it seems slightly different to how you relate to philosophy. Can yeah. you like just say something about why you turn there and how you work with it? Yeah. And... yeah. Well, a couple of things. That I guess the first thing I have to say is that, that I'm not a philosopher and I'm, and I'm not educated <laughs> much, <laughs> except in, in dance. Um, and so uh, that's both an excuse to like, or not an excuse, that's both a... Um, a way of getting myself off the hook, but I think it's also a way that I can approach philosophy like a material mm. um, and and not as a tradition that I need to um, write in or think in and therefore cover all the bases. So mm. I'm a little bit irreverent when I go into any text and the texts come at me often somewhat randomly because of projects I'm involved in or something I should Somebody says, oh, you should see that, or have you ever heard this idea? And I just write it down, and then I go, you know, look for it and, and, and try to chew on it in a way that makes sense to me as a, as a person whose practice is situated in my body mm. and in bodies in general. But to your point about that dance is not mentioned in most texts, even critical theory texts that yeah. I've tried to approach, some more successfully than others, most of them are, I, I usually have to, as I'm reading... It change the word art to the word dance, mm. just just as a reflex, and then it starts to maybe point or make sense to, to to what I'm what I'm after. The works that you mentioned, 
there was a series on um, on Badieu that I did. Uh, there was another one uh, called In Life and Love and so on. So that, that forms a kind of trilogy from whatever singularity to uh, In Life and Love and so on, which is a piece that's made for the Royal uh, Danish Opera mm. uh, Ballet, actually. And then in some sense was kind of the culmination of that. So I heard the lecture from Logic to Anthropology. It's a lecture that Alain Badieu gave. Uh, I can't remember exactly what the year is. I want to say 2012 or something like that for the European Graduate School. Mm. And they put all their stuff online, which is very thankful to those of us that are um, <clears throat> not <laughs> studying there. And I got really, I got as excited about the ideas that he was talking about as I did the tone with which he was talking about them. And he says, I think in an interview, that he's the only person he knows that continues to speak French while he speaks English, which is very apparent when he, because he is a, you know, uh, he, uh, he's, and it's like the most fabulous rhythm and counterpoint to his, to his voice. So I wanted to both see about what the ideas were that were operating in the, in the, in the lecture in which he's, he's talking a lot about the political field explicitly and sort of um, extrapolate that and deal with the concept of affirmation on an embodied level and then use the lecture itself as a kind of musical partiture. Um, so for example, in the second work in, uh, uh, in Life and Love and so on, I scored the first 35, 40 minutes of the lecture, which I edited and distributed it to a, a group of performers who would say the different words in different time signatures and, and in um, <clears throat> basically as an orchestra. Mm. So really making it explicitly into music which I suppose is not the thing you're supposed to do with philosophy. You're supposed to read it and think it through and then compare it and contrast it to other thinkers. And, um, and so, so it became like a, yeah, like a partiture, yeah. like a score. Yeah. 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 And a way of, of giving it inertia or, or putting, giving the ideas motion. That's how it makes sense to me. Otherwise I, because I'm not a thinker in the traditional sense in the academic sense. And I, I remember, I actually saw the lecture for the first time while I was uh, working with Rasmus Erlma on his uh, PhD project, um, Functionality Without Function. And we watched it and I was like, okay, I'm going to watch that one again because that one, the, something in that um, <clears throat> stuck with me. And um, I remember asking him, like, what do you think the difference is between doing artistic research or, or working in the field of performance, contra working? with a philosophy and ideas and performance theory, like what is the primary difference? And I hope I'm not misquoting him here, but what I remember anyway was he's saying, the difference when you work really in that tradition is preemptive defensiveness. So trying to foresee in what school of thinking uh, will, if you're building an argument or building a theory, what school of thinking will immediately want to, to um, tear it down and how. So this defensiveness, defending things as opposed to generating and proliferating. And I'm more in the generating and proliferating because I'm not trained in the other. Mm. So um, anyhow, I, I find his thinking around affirmation a very, very interesting idea. What happens when, you, when you're in motion and moving and thinking through a phrase or a material or improvising something and you immediately affirm whatever impulse and action happens without subjecting it to preemptive negation, mm. without subjecting it to um, uh, this kind of tiny little moment of editing, which is almost pre-conscious and sort of bringing that into the foreground of dancing and seeing what happens. So mm. that's, so I let the lecture structure the piece. But um, not actual so much the content. No, no the rhythm, yeah. the, the tempo, yeah. the, yeah. Exactly. But what's interesting in the, at least in some sense, which I saw at Dance and Seuss yeah. uh, in the spring, last spring, is that it creates this, in a way, quite, um, it made me think of this early 1960s works where you know someone like for example Ivan Rainer would use uh, where, where language uh, is like just when there's not an obvious relationship between uh, the movements yeah. uh, and uh, and the language yeah. you know she has this really one of her earliest works where she just uh, 
she records all of the addresses she's ever lived at. Right. And she just dances and she just uh, plays it. Like yeah. in a kind of classic avant-garde, yep. uh, like montage, you know, juxtaposing something. Mm -hmm. But which I think is kind of interesting because the way... Because you use someone like Badieu, uh, who has, as you say, this affirmative idea of like generative idea of philosophy and of, and of thinking. Um, yet, and, and which sort of structures your work, mm. yet at the same time, when we look at it, um, like the form of, at least in some sense, creates this uh, dissonance, which is quite, in, which I find really interesting. Uh, mm. Because it's not like you're mimicking what you're like. It's it's a yeah. It's a real dissonance mm. in 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 the in the lecture that uh, I can't remember. Yeah, we saw him in that work. Yeah, mm. yeah. He's uh, he's mm. uh, on the video, right? Mm. Uh, and in you moving and yep. yeah. So and in, in the first work, whatever singularity, which was a solo that I made for a, a dancer here in the Gothenburg Opera Dance uh -huh. Company, Maxime Lachon is his name. Um, that grew out of a. A practice that I started doing together with a, another artist and choreographer that I was working with, Cyril Baldi. And he, when we were on residency in Montreal, we, we started to listen to the lecture while running counterclockwise in a circle. I don't know, I don't even know why I was counterclockwise, what that was. Maybe it was one of those ideas like, oh, I moved this way, so now I'll move that. Maybe it was that simple, I can't remember. But I think what 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 I was trying to do at least was listen to it enough times that the content could spill into like to have my body as a as a receiving thing rather than only my <laughs> conceptual understanding of it so that i would get so familiar with the rhythm of how he would say things uh, because uh, bah -bah, uh, that uh, that that content whatever was behind that content would become intelligible to my body on a rhythmic level or on a, on a melodic scale and then hopefully also conceptually. So I, I wasn't interested in, in having his ideas illustrated one-to-one, -one, in that sense with the example that you're talking mm, about with mm. Yvonne Rainwright. In an ideal world, there's, a, there's a, a body logic that grows out of a relationship to those ideas that can exist on its own plane, mm. dr dramaturgically, mm. And then the ideas can also exist on their plane. And in the case of, in some sense, we also worked with a musician, Mikkel Plog, who's a um, jazz guitarist, who learned all of the melodies and harmonics of particular passages of Badia's voice in that lecture. I really <laughs> nerded out on it. <laughs> and, and, and that musical element, finding those two things together. But I really wanted in that work for, for, the, for the audience who sees it to be able to kind of drive into different cul-de-sacs, sort of, and, and see, see the, the, the idea level, the embodied level, and the kind of music and harmonic level. Yeah. Yeah. And in I the won't... first, in, in, in whatever singularity, that, that one I had Badia on the, on the video, so you could see him. He mm. would come and go. Yeah. And I divided it in, into chapters. Um, and the whole dance happened in a counterclockwise circle until uh, he made an exit mm -hmm. at the end. It was very simply structured, and it yeah. lasted for whatever it was, 20 minutes or something. And then in, in some sense, the last one, he wasn't seen on the screen, and I had these kind of titles that would... The, that would kind of highlight through the different parts of the piece. So I tried to divide the piece almost like one might divide a lecture, even though I've never yeah. really given a lecture, so I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I'm just guessing. I'm a charlatan, too. I'm just guessing, like, oh, you, if, you, if you were to provide this idea of linearity and then have a body that is not operating in that realm, can those two things coexist at mm. the same time? And, and can the audience be um, challenged and excited to like, go from there to that and go from that back up there? Oh yeah, yeah. Mm. And, and and try to sew together something that they hear and see. You know. I wanted. I I thought I had this quote by um, Jean Francois Lyotard, mm -hmm. um, another philosopher that you've that's been in your. But um, uh, let's come back to that. I wanted to ask you uh, something quite different. Uh, something that I think a lot about in relation to dance and. Um, 
so it's 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 related to work and to skill mm. maybe to virtuosity mm. uh, technique and um, I find it particularly interesting maybe to ask you because you're uh, you're very like skilled dancer you you know you worked you. <laughs> no but come on you worked I'll with take like that. Take yeah that in. You, <laughs> <laughs> you're you're a technically very like trained dancer you worked with foresight uh-huh. you know you worked yeah. with like um, um and um so like what uh, and you know in the pieces i've seen by you uh although they maybe question as i see it like they question for example a certain like linearity of the mm. body like um uh certain postures of the body it still technically it looks quite adva- like it looks quite difficult mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, w- what uh, and also when I've s- the group works you made, mm. uh, you work with like technically uh, like um, how to say it like good dance you know mm-hmm. um, dancers who are trained like yeah. Yeah. so my question is um, what what is skill for you what do you require from mm. your dancers like what does it mean for you mm. what is yeah what God, is what a good question. What, what are you looking for in yourself or maybe in your dancers? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, that's a great question. Let's see if I can unpack that a little bit. Because I'm not even sure I, I, at this point that I know the answer. But, but, you know, I went to ballet school. And ballet school is craft, 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 craft. Now you can believe in the ideology of it or ascribe to its ideals or not. But it's it's the principle of repetition, perhaps in the same sense that a classical violinist might just need to practice how to place the finger day after day after day after day. So that's that's my backpack. That the, in a way, I don't have another, I I don't necessarily have another choice except to create an opposition to that and not move with a particular skill set or something. But at that at this point, for me personally, that's not interesting. For me, mm. I, I think it is for others, and they do it very well. Um, and then, since then, I've been kind of marching out into this European contemporary dance world, um, kind of on the hunt for different ideals, different ideas, different um, types of bodies, different ways of performing, um, and different relationships to these very fundamental ideas about verticality, horizontality, frontality, this basic theater technology. Um, And for a while I took a little bit of a deviation and thought maybe I'll work in the visual arts context because that'll be, you know, at the moment I want to put it right back in a black box because that's the, that uh, my friend who was studying philosophy, she used to have this, she used to say, yes, but that's not an adequate problem. And I love the way she said it's like, I need to go to where the problem is mm. so that we can work at the site of the problem. Mm. And I mean problem in a really generative and exciting way. Yeah, yeah. Not like, oh gosh. It doesn't, doesn't no. Uh, so the black box, the expectation of skill or not, mm. um, they're all implicit, inscribed in that space. Um, I spent a lot of time through various people's work and through having the privilege of working with people like Bill Forsyth or, or Deborah Hay or others, um, really having, it, tr- translating that, that relationship to form from, from my background in education into an improvisational practice or as I'm starting to try to find it and define it more like a, a way of dancing. There was the book in the library over there, the John Berger Ways of Seeing, Ways Mm, of Dancing. mm, Um, mm, mm. So, um, and in a way, I find it's, so far anyway, it's necessary to have a certain understanding of your own body in terms of skill, but also the skill of performance, the, the craft of being able to read, understand how space is changing, how time is compressing, how these are kind of subtle things that you, that you learn over many, many, many years of performing in different ways. Um, and, and then to, to be able to balance and remix that. So, but I'm, I'm fascinated by people who have other skill sets than, mm. than the ones that I have, mm. because I think I'm, 
I think I'm essentially looking for a kind of way of dancing that doesn't necessarily produce the same kind of body stylistically, mm. but is is actually is an aesthetic inquiry that offers this proliferation, that one, that one, that one. But mm. skill seems to be a common denominator. Yeah. And um, and at the same time, so to to make the paradox, it's also the thing that's standing in your way the most. Because it's entangled with your identity, it's how you imagine, it, you set up ideals without even really realizing, they slip right out, you signal things that people are averse to, or are really attracted by, this kind of old idea of virtuosity that's hanging out in the dance world of like, and it's negation that we've now been through two or three cycles of, so the beautiful half-clothed body of a 23-year-old with its leg kind of like that, and then like the, the rejection of it. I think that somewhere in the middle there's a marriage of that, that ability to be extremely skillful and practice a kind of contemporary <laughs> inquiry or aesthetic inquiry. And yeah, that's... but you, you're also saying something that I also wanted to ask you, which I find really interesting, which is you mentioned the, the, the black box as a problem, like the, the theater as yeah. a, a, and how that's linked with the expectation of a specific and sure. skill, how to break that and how, how to, uh, which also leads me to um, another question I had, which was um, in a lot of your works, you use a very like kind of, the simple technologies of the theater, yeah. let's say like the, the, do you say curtains? The curtains yeah, yeah, the curtains, um, like it's often very like simple, but like using the simple, and, and it's almost like you've answered the question by saying that the, by saying that like the problem, what's the problem? The problem is the, the, the black box, the theater. But my question was like, so what is a theater? What, why, why dance in the theater? Uh -huh. Like, I don't know if you have any more answer to that than what you've already given, but yeah. I anyway, want to post yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what is a theater? You know, yeah. why, why yeah. the theater? Well, it's the it's the site of the adequate problem, and it's also the site of the potential remixing of that, you know. And so I feel like that's why it it necessarily at this point for me anyway needs to happen there. Mm. Social dancing is as old as time eternal. And I think is something operating from a from a really different impulse. I think placing dance in a in a, a black box is is um, <clears throat> placing it in the realm of art, and not that social dancing isn't artistic or doesn't have a lot of craft to it. Um, my earliest dancing experience that predates starting to dance uh, ballet is Eurythmia. I was, went mm -hmm. to a Waldorf school, and my mother's folk dancing classes that she take us to and you know you'd be in the corner half sleeping on the backpacks while the Irish folk dancers or the Israeli folk dancing groups would you know um, <clears throat> which is a funny I, I don't find that as vibrant a, a, a form of dancing in Europe as I do in, in, in the US like this kind of community dance you meet in the basement mm. of the church on Wednesdays and every Wednesday you meet those people and you do Irish folk dancing you know or, or um, here we have a tendency to institutionalize things much more quickly. Mm, or, or, yeah. But anyway, to answer the, the to try to grapple with the question of the the black box, I I think it's the place. It's also the place that shares. It's the space that's also shared with its much more muscular cousin, which is theater, <laughs> <laughs> language, <laughs> and. I think it's exciting, potentially exciting, to try to remind people that we still don't yet know what our body is. We have so many presupposed ideas that are, that are either inherited from language or come out through language, and I love language, so mm. just to say as a, but, um, or and, our bodies are, and our perceptive, uh, being is a lot richer than that. It's a lot richer than we give it credit for. And um, so I think it's interesting to place that counterpoint at the same site as language keeps operating in the traditional sense anyway, if we leave the avant-garde aside for a moment, to reinscribe very ratified stories about who we are, what life means, <laughs> mm. 
you know, what is the end goal, what is transcendence, all this stuff. And dance falls often falls um, falls victim is the wrong word, but but kind of in order to justify its existence, runs after that and tries to hook onto it. And you get this very strange sort of, without going into a critique, but very strange kind of pantomiming. And so turning to the simple techne of the technology of the theater, like an exit and an entrance, there's a world in that. <laughs> also philosophically and you know aesthetically, there's a world in, in just that paying attention to the diagonal of the exit. It's stupid, but fun, and also, I mean stupid in the best sense, but also, um, what is that? Mm. You know, that precept, that simple thing. And I guess I asked that question from a place of having trained for the 10,000 hours, at least in the classical paradigm, to know an exit, well you exit, the angle of your shoulders, you know, we practice this stuff mm. for hours. When you exit, your head must, and then you go this way. So, I, so to the question of skill, well, those skills are now, hopefully, after these 20-some years, I can claim them as like, okay, at least this I know. Mm. So this is the material I can use to filter the ideas that um, I'm curious to ask, which is, again, this thing I still don't yet know. And can I find a way to make that co-inquiry intelligible to people? That's the... That's the invitation mm. to people who are seeing it. It doesn't always work. <laughs> I like it. You know, um, uh, before you were saying, uh, I'm going to find my, the, another question that I had, but uh, I often say this, this to my students. I want you to have a problem, not problem in this bad sense, but yeah. problem in a productive generative, sense. Generative. Yeah. yeah, in a generative sense. And we find this idea of the problem in uh, Kant, but also in Deleuze. You know, there are many philosophers who recently I read uh, Gaston Bachelard has a, an amazing, uh, beautiful uh, idea of the problem. And somehow, you're, when I hear you uh, talk, it's like there is this tradition of craft, of skill, also of this of the, the set technology of the theater, uh, yet in your work, uh, when I see your works, it's like looking for uh, a singular movement, looking for a singular, but like somehow looking for something new constantly, like, um, and you say somewhere, I can't remember where, you say, if there is a defining feature of my work, it is this to pay attention to the given circumstances, phenomena, or ideas that constitute the conditions in which dancing is taking place. Uh -huh. yeah. This is an emergent notion of choreography rather than a repetition of given forms and ideals. And I this is an emergent notion of choreography uh -huh. rather yeah. than a repetition of given forms and ideals. Yeah. So my question is, When does that searching for, when does that emergent notion of choreography, this searching, let's say, can that become a style? Sure. Can that become, become a form? And what do you do then? Yeah, like? I think, uh, so three short points on that. One, there is a tradition of this. I'm obviously not inventing that. I'm trying to find language on the shoulders of the people who, particularly from let's say, early 20th century onwards, part of the modernist and postmodernist tradition. So, um, <clears throat> but I think at work there's a basic inversion. So s to pay more attention um, to the conditions in which this dancing is happening, as opposed to what am I doing, what does it mean, and how can I reproduce that meaning such that it's immediately intelligible to people seeing it. And that also dovetails a little bit with an interest that I've had for many years in uh, Zen practice, which is often talking about the conditions of life as being m more <laughs> operative than we like to give them credit for, mm. at least in this part of the world, where the center of action is a me in a mine, mm. and that I'm the author of this situation. So this is just simply what if, <laughs> to borrow a bit of Deborah's language also, what if Authorship is happening in a relationship to how I see, hear, feel, and perceive space, filtered through the skills that are hard won over many years of practice. 
Um, and yes, it can become, there are isms that are hanging out everywhere because all of us, I think, are conditioned also internally to want to notice patterns and hang on to those patterns. And so the question when you begin to notice, oh, this is turning into a kind of, this has a little bit of an ism smell to it, then what is, rather than trying to get rid of it, what is, what's a new strategy or response when you notice that? How can you um, pay attention to something or someone or, or an idea or a texture or something such that you can kind of let that slip or fade or fall? And um, I think that I heard, this may not answer that so much, but I heard um, actually a lecture by Giorgio Gamben called Resistance in Art, where he talks about uh, the, 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 act, the, the act is always inframed by its potential not to happen. He's talking about potentiality. And uh, he writes about in Bach, and that's what I'm currently working on with this Bach project that I'm rehearsing now. He talks about the, the struggle in, I think he's referring to something that Deleuze might have said, but don't quote me on it, um, that there's this struggle in Bach between the profane and the sacred. <laughs> that there's this like, this body that's producing spit and bile and is kind of like proto-mechanical, even though it's absolute genius because its cells are doing radical things all the time and there's an intelligence at the center of it. And, but not to reify it, but it is this kind of... And then this kind of sacred, vertical, methodological, higher metaphysical world. And that these two things, and that, that often we want to separate those two things. And he's saying that in Bach, you, you, they're inseparable. This yearning and striving for the, for um, some kind of perf perfection, perfectness, and this kind of insistent pr profanity in a nice way of what I'm thinking about the body. Of course, I wouldn't think about the body, and I, I like that idea. And maybe that's the tension at work between classicism and 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 the contemporary, and 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 that there's it's an impossibility to think that you can march away from either or fully. They are in framing one another and there's a dynamic tension between the two of them. I think for me experientially that was certainly, in my experience, certainly something that I felt in, in Bill Forsythe's work. That those two things, you know, contemporary art, thinking, philosophy, music, ideas could it coexist in a room full of people whose background was tondus and plies and, and that those two things could, could be dynamic with each other. And that, I mean, I, I have a question for you too, but, uh, but the door is opening. And... Yeah, but I think, <laughs> I think I'm, hey. Hey. <laughs> um... <laughs> I think I think I'm fine. You're yeah. fine. Yeah. You're going to get away without me asking you a question. <laughs> I think we should end that. <laughs>